the secret of the universe is that we're all making this up as we go. This is all made up. There's literally no rules here. Like you can go and it, there's no, anyone who says you can't do something, it's like, wh where does that come from? How do you, at some point people are like, you're, you want to fly? No, you're not going to be able to do that. We've just proven it wrong so many times. There are literally no rules. In order to play bigger, you have to think bigger. And you have to know that there are quite simply no limitations on what's possible. So if you see a better path, you see a better way, you see a big dream, go fight for that dream. Welcome to The Raquel Show. This show is for entrepreneurs who want to play bigger in business and in life. And today I have a very special guest who I met at an event and is an absolutely like rock star that I fell in love with because I got to connect with her. And I heard about her through mutual friends and they were right. She is a powerhouse and an amazing mama. She is the founder and CEO of Lead Syndicate which is a platform supporting real estate agents in over 150 locations. She's the co-host of the One Thing podcast, and that has reached over 11 million listeners and is the chairwoman of the board, KWKC, a 501c3 that empowers young entrepreneurs to unlock their full potential. Welcome to the show, Nikki Miller. Hello, I'm so excited to be here. I'm excited to have you. And when I read your bio, everyone probably listening right now is like, wow. And I know that this didn't happen overnight. So let's just start with like, how did you even come up with the idea? And we'll talk about your platform first of Lead Syndicate. Yeah, it certainly didn't happen overnight. And I think this is probably the question I get the most because I think when people meet me in person or see me on social, they're like, you're so young. I'm like, yes. And I got the gift of I started young and found what I loved early. And, and that was just luck and, and intuition and, and just really the gift of, of finding my sort of place early. But I certainly didn't find this model that early and, and fell into it through my own struggles. I started, I always say I very much grew up in real estate, graduated college when I was 20 and went directly into real estate. So I worked at, as an underwriter for a real estate investment and development firm early. So really understood the finance side and knew that I didn't want to do that forever. I ended up moving from where I was from in L.A. to Northern California and thought, well, what am I going to do now? I don't want to start over in another development firm. I really wanted to become an investor myself and had always wanted to be more in residential than I did in commercial. Just was a lot more attractive to me, not only as an investor, but also just from an interest level. And so I thought, why don't I'll go and become an agent? And I joined a real estate brokerage, joined KW, and I'm 22 years old at the time. And I did all the things that they told me to do and ended up becoming a really successful individual agent and was starting to build a brand. People were starting to know who I was. Fast forward, I sort of hit my ceiling after maybe a year and a half, two years into it as an individual agent. It was the top individual agent in my office. And I went into my manager's office one day and I said, hey, I've hit my ceiling of achievement. I, I cannot take one more client. I don't have any more hours in the day. And at this point in my life, I don't have any kids. I don't have any pets. I don't even have a goldfish. I have nothing that I'm responsible for other than myself and my business. I, wa I wasn't even married yet. Like I, it just, I had so little responsibility. And I saw the writing on the wall early. I said to myself, okay, if I want to have a future in this business, I'm going to have to figure out a way to not work 100 hours a week. And so I said, okay, I need help. I, not only can I not take any more transactions, but I'm a workhorse. So if I'm dying, like I, can't, this, I know this can't be normal. And so she said, all right, well, now what we're going to do is we're going to get you a coach and we're going to send you all the classes and you're going to learn how to hire people and you're going to learn how to fire people and you're going to learn how to do the database and you're going to learn how to build systems and you're going to learn how to manage the transaction. I was like, I don't think you heard me correctly. I said, I've got too many jobs. This sounds a whole lot like another job. And she said, this is how it's always been done. They'll never forget that that's the verbatim what she said to me. And she said, this is how it's always been done. So following that model and that path, I said, all right, well, if this is how everybody do, does it, I guess I'll go and figure that out. So I got the coach and I went to the classes and I spent six months doing the roller coaster that a lot of individual real estate agents do. And I started to try to build these things out and I just hated it, Raquel. I just was like, I don't want to manage people and I don't want to build this stuff out. 
And it's taking me away from what made me successful in the first place, which was just providing a kick-ass client experience and being great at that job. And so I went back into my manager's office and I said, hey, thanks so much for all these classes and for the coach and all these things, but I don't want to do any of this. And she was like, what? And I said, yeah, I don't want to do any of this. Somebody before me has figured this out and I would love to just pay them to do it. Real estate has not changed in a really long time. Yeah. Somebody has figured out the operating model. I want to just pay them to do it. And she said, you can't do that. That doesn't exist. The only option you would have would be to join a team. And I didn't like the financial model of a team and also not dissimilar to today. Teams were in their early iterations. They were figuring it out. No two teams were alike. There was no set standard for what a team even meant. At that time, there was a lot of people, you know, connected by one person's credit card. That's really the loose definition of a team. And they had no systems and no models and, and, and there was no standard by which they operated. And I thought, OK, that's how I'm operating right now. That's not going to help me. That's just doing it with another group of people who are a hot mess. And I also didn't want to have to give up my brand and put my production under them. So I was like, OK, well, that's off the table. And she said, well, then you have to figure out how to do it yourself. I'm like, I, I just came in here because I don't want to do that. And she said, well, then your only other option is to stay where you are. And I thought to myself, this sucks. All these options suck. <laughs> and I don't like any of them. So by force, I ended up building it out myself, built an expansion team throughout California, ended up moving back to Southern California and taking over a really big brokerage that had 500 agents who were doing $2 billion in sales volume a year. And it was there that I realized that this problem that I had as an individual agent was not unique to me at all. Every other individual agent that I was now managing and working with was going through the same iteration that I had gone through. And so I looked up and said, oh, my gosh, this is Groundhog Day. And I am having the almost identical conversation with them that my team leader had before me. I have no new information, no new solutions. And this is almost a little under a decade later. I'm like, I'm not. I literally had a moment where I just stood up in my office and said, I'm not doing this anymore. There's got to be a better way. And I am going to go find the better way because I refuse to be bound by the way it's always been done. So I left that position in late 2020. and. I just had some time. Like we were in 2020. I just had my daughter. So I just, for the probably the first time ever in my life, had just some white space, mm -hmm. and, which gave me the ability to think. It was a, a lesson in and of itself, but it gave me the ability to think. And I asked myself probably a question that changed the trajectory of my life and career, which was, what do I wish that I had? I keep saying that all these things don't work and all, I don't like this and I don't like that. But what am I actually saying? What I'm really saying is that I wish that I had something different. So can I clearly articulate what I wish that I had? And when I asked myself that question, I literally wrote down, I wanted all the economies of scale, all the benefits, all the infrastructure, all the best parts of being on a team. But I didn't want to have to give up my brand and I didn't want to have to be on that split and I didn't want to have to be on production under them. I wanted to retain my identity. I also wanted all the best parts of having built out a team, but I didn't really want to be responsible for people. And I didn't want the monthly overhead of what that takes. Mm -hmm. And so I said, what could I create that models both of those? What could I create that's literally an answer to both of those questions? That's what I wish that I had. And that's how the Lead Syndicate was born. So we are exclusively optimized and designed for individual real estate agents. And we support their business. And in, like I said, all the economies of scale, benefits and infrastructure of being on a team. But we allow them to retain their brand. They operate autonomously and we run their business for them to help them grow and help them stay focused on what matters most and actually accelerate their business in order to get to where they want to be without having to kill themselves trying. Oh, my gosh. There is a lot of gold that you said. And can you guys all probably can hear why I love this woman, because she is so real, so raw, so authentic. And I know a lot of people that are listening right now could relate and go, wow, what a dream. And as you were speaking about that, it's like all the agents that I've ever met. And I ran, obviously, an office just like yourself with lots of agents in the downturn is is there an Uber app for like, can I just borrow a transaction coordinator? Can I just go get marketing? Can I just have somebody do my social? And I feel like this is what Nikki has created for that individual agent that doesn't want to manage people, that doesn't want to give up their brand. A hundred percent. And it's also that I tell people all the time, we support agents very comprehensively in what I call the big five. So it's coaching and training, database management, marketing, lead generation, and transaction management. And I'll look up and say, pieces of how we support the agent are available everywhere. Like you could have someone who just manages your database, or you could get a TC to your point, or you could work with a lead generation company. But 
what so many people don't put enough energy and weight is weight in is what when I'm walking an agent through what we do, what the difference might be than them finding ancillary support in all of the pieces and the ways that we support them is the cost and energy of the agent having to put all of these pieces together in order to make sure they talk. Mm -hmm. I don't think enough people have that conversation because it's I have to think about telling my marketing person what to put out and I have to curate the content and I have to be the one to make sure the TC did this and I have to be the one to make sure the TC talks to this person and I have to be the one to make sure that the database person talks to the marketing person or that it all gets out. And The energy and time that that takes is just exhausting. Yeah. And by the way, all of that takes away from what your production Right. What matters most and what, by the way, most agents are good at and why they got in the business in the first place. Yeah. So good. And so then like for teams or entrepreneurs that are listening, it's probably like having a franchise in so many markets. You have over 150 plus locations today across the U.S. Yeah. All in the U.S. What do you think some of the challenges are that you face today with what you've built? Oh, man. Shall we start chronologically or alphabetically? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's just it's just evolved so much over time. And it's funny because I get, I get to ask this question a lot. What's your biggest challenge that you're facing today? And I've, I've almost become immune is not the right word because I'm certainly not immune. I'm human like everybody else. Yeah. But I've just been able to metabolize challenges so much better because there were so many of them in building this. That what a lot of people might perceive to be a challenge, I'm just like, this, this is just a whole, this is just another, another Thursday, here we go. And I've just gotten really amenable and good at taking some of these changes in stride. Our industry right now is going through a lot of volatility and a lot of change, and people are losing their ever-loving minds. I know that you're seeing this too, and people are freaking out and losing it. And so many people are reaching out to me to talk about it. And I'm like, whatever the change may be, I'm going to focus on what I can control and whatever chaos is happening around me that I can't control, I'm just going to release it. And so when I see a challenge, what I really see is what can I do about this? Can I do something about this? And if I can, I'm going to tackle it. And if I can't, I'm going to release it. Mm -hmm. And do I show up that way perfectly every day? Sure. No, like I get worried like everybody else does and, and I get nervous like everyone else does or down or whatever it is. But ultimately, I've gotten pretty good at dealing with what's in front of me that I have control over and releasing anything that's outside of what I can even yes. do anything about, right? I feel like you were on our mastermind call this this morning because that's exactly what I said. It's what can you control? There's things that are just out of your control and you're worrying really? about things that you cannot control and have no impact on today. Yeah. Right? And if you can't, then you have to just release it or it's going to make you crazy because you're worrying over it just a puts you in this purgatory of having to experience it a million times before you ever actually experience it. And I, what I tell our team is it's, it's probably not going to be as good as you want it to be. And it's probably not going to be as bad as you think it'll be. Like ultimately the outcome of whatever it is, like whatever you're worried about, whether it's that conversation that you're worried about having or that deal that you're worried about keeping together or that thing that's outside of you that you're concerned about, probably not going to be as bad as you're making it up to be in your head and probably not as good as you hope it'll be. And Either way, you're going to find yourself somewhere in the middle and you're going to do what you can do in, in that situation to control it. And you will find the opportunity when it Always. comes. If right? you look for it, if you if want you, to. A hundred percent. Where do you hope to take lead syndicate, Nikki? I think if I look up, and I always feel like I give a really bad answer to this question. Someone's like, where do you want to be in five years? I'm like, I don't know. I'll be in five <laughs> years. It's more who I want to be. Uh, but if I look up at the lead syndicate specifically, I say, I set out to make a vote for the individual agent. And I remember, Raquel, when I started this and people told me, like, Nikki, you're crazy. Teams are where it's at. Teams are everything. Teams are the future. And I thought to myself, that might be true. And yet what I see is all these incredible individual entrepreneurs out there who are asking for a better way and nobody is giving it to them and who are asking for a future that no one else believes in and no one else is fighting for. And so where I hope to take the lead syndicate is not only an example of what can happen when you solve a very real problem, but also where I hope to take it is a consistent operating platform that allows individual real estate agents to do what they do best and to get to experience why they got into real estate in the first place. And I hope that I can 
look up at our company and our platform and for people to say that was the thing that helped make me successful or even more successful. And that was a thing that allowed me to stay in love with real estate as opposed to beating my head against the wall and feeling like I'm failing at, at an unwinnable game. Because I think that's what a lot of individual agents are up against. There's hundreds of jobs that a real estate agent has to do. And this idea that a person could be good or should be good at all of them is atrocious. And we try to stuff it down people's throats. And I'm like, it's just wrong and not true. And I hope to show that there is a better way and a smoother way that we can pull back the curtain and say, let us do these things. You do what matters most. Do it authentic to you and get to build the business that you always dreamed of. Yeah. it's And when you're speaking about that, I think about even like building a house. It's like you never like the architect, the builder, the handyman, the carpet person. But yet in our industry, we're expected to be all of that unless we build a team. Totally. And there's I don't know about you, but in our industry, I I feel like there's this idea that's just stuffed down people's throats that they have to build a team to be successful. And I look up and say, I know a lot of really big teams and we both do. And many of them are good friends of mine. And so many of them go through years of pain where they are far less profitable and working far harder than they ever did as an individual agent. And I look up at agents that come and interview with us who are like, I want to build a team one day. And my first question to, to them is, why? Do you really? Because I can tell you that there's a whole slew of jobs that come from building a team that you probably don't want and a whole slew of liability and challenges that probably have nothing to do with why you got into real estate in the first place. And so I think it's the way I look at it is, and, and by the way, no hate on teams. I'm like, in effect, no. we're, we're team adjacent, right? And ultimately, I, I want people to build what feels authentic to them and what feels right to them and to not pressure our industry about what success looks like. Because I think a lot of agents look up and say, I'm going to keep it small and I'm going to make it easier on myself. And I'm going to build something I'm really proud of without all of the noise around me. And by the way, I'm going to net far more than I would if I were to try to do all these things on my own. So good. And when I was in Vegas with you, and this kind of leads me to my next point, you shared a concept of how would you like to pay? And I think it's perfect for oh, it's my what favorite. you just said. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was just absolutely brilliant. So like share with the audience how you laid out how would you like to pay? Because that's like you're known for that. Yeah, totally. <laughs> It's, it became my favorite business principle that I can articulate much better now than I could when I was that young individual agent in my manager's office saying, I don't want to do this. Because the options she gave me were build it yourself, stay where you are, or join a team. And what, what it ended up morphing into in my head was no matter what, growth requires payment. One of my favorite sayings is that the bill is going to become due. You get to decide when and how you're going to choose to pay it. And it became this principle in my ecosystem whenever my team would come to me with a challenge, especially in our really early days when it was just a couple of us, like trying to do 100 jobs to, to make this crazy idea that I had work. And so they would come to me with a challenge and I would simply ask them, how would you like to pay? And that's now how I talk with agents when they say, I don't know if I should build this myself, stay where I am or join your platform. And then I'll simply ask them, how would you like to pay? Option number one is that you do it. In other words, you spend the time, you spend the money, you spend the energy, you figure it out. And the upside to this is that no one can ever take that knowledge away from you. You get to own that forever. No one can ever take away the fact that I know what it takes. And the reason I can articulate the agent's position so well is because I did it. I know what it takes to struggle through that. And no one can ever take that away from me. But the downside is that this is a real slow path to growth. Even with the coach, even with the class, even with the model, it's just a really slow way to grow as you figure it out. And option number two is that you hire somebody else to do it. And by the way, you see this in companies all the time. Maybe you pay more for that executive who has done that job before. I'm going to pay top dollar for an executive who's taken a company public before if I want to take a company public because they have the experience. I'm going to pay if I want to join a team or if I want to join a platform. And the upside to paying for that is that you get to go much faster, right? You get to, that person or that organization gets to move you through all of the hurdles that you wouldn't even know to look for if you had never been there before. So it's a much faster path to growth. But the downside is that you have to hold yourself accountable to the spend. I think so many agents pay more and say, I'm going to hire this admin or this ops director. I'm going to hire this team or this leverage platform. And then they're like, awesome. I hired them. Now I get to sit back and I don't have to do anything. I'm like, no, that's not how it works either. You have to use the time 
that you get back wisely. You have to use all of this excess time that this person or organization has freed up for you in order to go back and do what matters most in your organization. For agents, that's almost always going to be your prospect and your client experience, right? And then, of course, option number three is you do nothing at all. And the upside to this is that nothing has to change. This was an option that my manager at the time was giving me. She was like, you can just stay where you are. And by the way, I was dying. Like, I was absolutely crumbling. She's like, yeah, you just keep doing what you're doing. I'm like, okay. The upside to that is that nothing has to change. Change requires us to get uncomfortable. And so the upside to option number three is if you stay where you are, you don't have to get uncomfortable. Nothing has to change. You get to stay exactly where you are. But the downside is that I always tell people, remember, the question is, how would you like to pay? And you're not going to pay for this one today. You're not going to pay for it tomorrow. But eventually, you will pay the compound interest of not resolving this problem. And so when I look up with agents, they'll come to me and they'll almost always the conversation goes something like this, especially when we were in a really good market. Like this conversation's happened a lot between 2021 and now where I talked to them in 2021 was our first conversation. They were like, you know what, Nikki, I'm good. I'm going to choose option number one. I'm going to do it. I'm going to figure these things out. I'm amazing. I can do all the things. And I'm like, you are. And they'll say, this is the year I'm going to figure out that database thing and all my systems. And I'm like, that is amazing. How many years in a row have you said that? And they're like, this is my eighth year. But Nikki, this is the year. This is the year I'm going to figure it out. I'm like, all right, Godspeed. And then they came back to me this year, most of them, and said, hey, turns out I actually chose option number three, which is what most agents do. They'll say I'm choosing option number one. I'm going to do it myself. But really, they choose option number three, which is I did nothing about it. And then eventually the market changes or they do that for long enough. And then they pay the compound interest of not resolving whatever that challenge is in their business. So that's how would you like to pay? And to me, it was just, it's just a really clear path to what do you want to do? You get three choices and these are the ways that you're going to have, you're going to have to resolve this problem. You have three choices about how you're going to do it. Just make a real authentic decision about how you want to move forward. And I love that concept because it applies not only just to the real estate industry, to everything in life, right? Like how would you like to pay? And we know that growth does not happen by yourself. And as you said, in this last conversation, you go back and you're like, I did nothing for the last couple of years and I wasted time. And you also probably wasted money without even realizing it because of that compound that you just talked about. So I know that growth does not happen in isolation. Who have been your mentors or coaches that have impacted your life to get there quicker? Oh, my gosh. You paid like forward even quicker, right? Because you probably use that concept a lot in your own life and in your own business. For sure. I'm a huge advocate. If you follow me on social or YouTube or anything like that, anyone who knows me well knows that I am an avid reader and a huge advocate of reading. For $15, $12, $10, like whatever the book costs, you can literally get someone's life lessons, the things that they have paid to learn and all of their experiences in the form of a book. And all it costs you is is your $12 and your time to read it. And so I don't understand. There's a reason there's a, a saying leaders are readers. And I don't understand why people who are trying to solve problems don't go directly to a book. It's one thing to talk to a mentor who may have been there before. But when I think about solving problems or doing something, I want to go to the best, the best of the best. And by the way, the best of the best, that person is not always alive. I can't always call them or find Holy them. Or they might be, exactly. Right. Like, they, yeah, like they, might, they might be out of my reach. I might not be able to talk to them. If I want to learn how to innovate, there's probably no one alive that I want to talk to more than I want to talk to Steve Jobs. I want to learn about how he thought about things and how he approached things and why was he successful. So I'm going to go and read his biography. And if I want to learn about investing, sure, you can watch the finance bros on YouTube or I can read a book about Warren Buffett, the greatest investor of all time. So to me, that there's so many mentors I have in the form of books and, and almost any problem I so, need to solve or want to solve, I start there. Um, but I also have some, some incredible mentors that colleagues, I, I consider most of my friends in this business have been mentors. To me, at everyone I meet, I've learned so much from you. I've learned so much from a lot of the mutual friends that we have. I'm endlessly curious. Like just part of my personality is I have curiosity around how things work and how people think about things. I'm just a student of human nature and development. And so it, it makes me a constant learner. I hear things. I'm like, oh, that's a really good idea. And so I'm constantly learning. And then also Gary Keller, Jay Papazan, I'm the, the host of the One Thing podcast. And, and so I've been able to work with them very closely, not only in that, but also in, in the Keller Williams ecosystem. They've been longtime mentors of mine and are just amazing students themselves of real estate and of personal growth. 
And I could go on forever. There's so many. I've got, I've had, I've been privileged to have some really incredible coaches over the years, just really lucky with the people that I've been around. And, and like I said, a lot of the amazing people that we both call mutual friends who've just really taught me along the way. So I'm curious, what's the book that you're reading or what's the book that you'd recommend to our audience today? Oh my gosh. It depends on what you want to work on, right? I, I'm a huge Ryan Holiday fan, like huge Ryan Holiday fan. And so I've read all of his books, but I say his name because he puts out a great monthly reading list and I pay a lot of attention, mostly because I'm a student of Stoic philosophy specifically, that I pay attention to what he recommends. So if you don't know where to start, I'd get on I'd get on his email list. It's a, a, a plug for him. And the book that I recommend to everybody is Meditations by Marcus Aurelius. It's my, it's my little statue. That's who that is right there. And and so that's the book that I recommend to everybody. But I would offer for everyone to say, where am I weak or what do I need to work on or what would have the maximum effect on on my business or my life or wherever I'm feeling challenged right now? And and then go there, go read that. I know that right now I'm specifically reading, rereading, I've read it before, but I'm rereading The Road Less Stupid. And if you haven't read that, it's a great one. And for me, it's this ever quest of my sort of natural ability the the universe conspires in our favor and the universe conspired for me to have to figure things out because it turns out that as much as I didn't want to build operations or scale anything, and it turns out that's like what I'm actually naturally really good at. And so the challenge there, though, is that as your organization grows, you have to scale your leadership and you have to be able to teach people how to think about these problems so that they can solve them when you're not around. And so that's the challenge that I've been facing as we grow. And so that's the book that I came back to right now. But I wouldn't say there's one. I think there's just so many that I would say, like I said, meditations is a book I always recommend or the compound effect. Like I think that's a really yeah, I think that's a really important one because I think that a lot of people we talk about the compound effect in a positive way a lot, like doing these small actions or investing the small amount of money. But I don't think that we talk about the opposite of the compound effect Mm -hmm. enough, which is like you can also compound bad behavior and bad decisions and these small inactions that eventually lead you the other direction too. So it's it's one of my favorite books. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. One of my favorite books for that reason too. Oh my gosh. So one of the things that I also love about you is how clear you were about your Like you riffed on stage about your mission statement, your personal mission statement. And I want you to share that with the audience because I have questions around what you shared in Vegas. Yeah, I am very clear on my mission. I took my mission statement, so to speak, is I'm here to be a leader worth following and through my example to inspire others to live authentically and abundantly. That's what I believe that I was put here to do. I always, I, I articulate it as like, I have this theory that your creator, whomever you believe that to be, like, we sign this contract when we get the privilege to come back, you know, come down here to earth and, and we sign this contract about what we're supposed to do while we're here. And I believe that that's why I was put here. And for me, it's a constant reminder of how I need to show up. And as my life has gotten bigger, it's also become my compass, so to speak. Like, I, I'm sure you experience this on a day to day too, but the bigger that you your life gets and the bigger the stage that you stand on, the more you get asked for things and the more that can tug on your sleeve and on your heart and on your attention. And and I am I have a big heart for people and I want to help. Like I want to have maximum impact for people. And I had to have a real moment with myself after I had my daughter as my life has grown of I can't be everywhere and I can't do everything and I can't say yes to everything. And so I'm like, well, how am I going to decide what I say yes to and what I say no to? That just became, that became a couple of years ago. That was my biggest challenge. I'm like, I want to say yes to everything. Yes, yes, yes. And to everybody, but you can't do that. And so I said, all right, well, how am I going to filter my yeses? How am I going to make a decision about what I say yes to and what I say no to? And so I wrote that mission statement and I literally have it framed. It's like right behind me. So I'm always, or right in front of me. So I'm always looking at it. It's up on my wall. And every time somebody asks me to do something, travel to speak, join this webinar, do this podcast, whatever it is. I look right at that mission statement and I ask myself, is it a yes in the direction of this mission statement? Like, does this actually help me fulfill this? And if it's not, then I won't do it. If it's a maybe at this phase of my life, I also won't do it. I'm just too busy. And that's sort of my compass. That became my true north. Yeah. See, I love that. And I know we talked about that on our car ride to the airport is how clear you were about that compass or about that mission statement. And that became a compass to your north star. And I think so many times and very guilty is like you have all these opportunities and you want to say yes to everything and it's bright and shiny. And you're just like, and then you look up and you're like, what did I just do for the last three months? Right? How did this align with what what I was set out to do? And also whose life am I living? You just end up literally spinning your wheels, chasing your tail and feeling, becoming just a 
like chaos embodied by by doing trying to do all of these things. And by the way, you're also not showing up as best as you could because you're tired. It's just yeah. like a really great way to exhaust yourself. Yeah. And I said, I want to have maximum impact and show up at, to my maximum capacity. And the only way to do that is to actually do less. Yeah. So how do you manage it all? You do lots of things. Like I said, you're a mama. How do you prioritize your time and set boundaries to ensure that you're serving your personal mission as well as your business like mission or entrepreneur like life? Yeah. I think this is this is always a loaded question for me because I think sometimes when we're asked this question, we can articulate as if we all have it all figured out. And before before I give my tactic, I don't. Some days I kill it at this. And some days I don't get it right. Like hell, mo most days I don't get it right. But I think we're all trying to work like we don't have kids and have kids like we don't have work. And I don't nail that every single day. But one of the one of the things that happened that I was very fortunate for when I was early on in my pregnancy, I was, I think, maybe four or five months pregnant. And I have a girlfriend who runs a very, very, very large tech company. She's very successful. And we were about to do a podcast together. And we're in this, we're stepping in. She had just had her son. And she was just sobbing. Like we were backstage and she's like sobbing. And I'm in my head. I'm like, we got to go out on the stage in five minutes and be recorded. And this girl's like losing her mind. And she just was looked at me and she said, Nikki, I'm just failing at everything. Like being a mom and a business owner sucks. I'm just failing at everything all the time. And I remember I'm five months pregnant, right? And I'm like, well, this is not good. This does not look like a positive future for me. And I had this moment. I made this decision actively right in that moment and said to myself, well, if I'm going to fail, I guess I'll just fail phenomenally at one thing at a time. And so what it ended up turning into is I've just gotten really good at being wherever my feet are. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is when I'm at work, I am at work. Like I am not on social media. I'm not chit-chatting at the water cooler. I am at work. I do not walk into my day without a plan. I know exactly what I am there to execute. And that's what I do while I'm there. I know that I only have a certain amount of time, especially my daughter just started preschool this year. And the amount of time I have has lessened even more so. And I have only have a certain amount of time to be intentional and to get anything done. And I have to maximize that. So I'm not looking at my phone. I'm not texting my friends. I'm not on social. I am at work executing my most important things. And then when I get home and I pick my daughter up and we're having our time, I'm really intentional with that time. I put my phone away. My team knows like they quite literally cannot get a hold of me because there are literally no real estate emergencies. Anything can wait a couple hours. And I am very intentional with my time I have with her. We get two or three hours in the morning or two or three hours at night. And when I'm there, I am fully there. I'm not sitting on the couch scrolling social. She's not watching TV. We are engaged. We're playing together. We're interacting. It's real time, which to me is far more effective than spending all day but being distracted for 90% of it. And so I just made a decision that if I'm going to be somewhere, I'm just going to be wherever my feet are. Like, if I'm going to be here with you, I'm going to be all the way here. I'm not thinking about all these other things. And that's my commitment to being in the moment that I'm in. And I found, Raquel, that if I can't do that, I just exit. I will tell my team sometimes I am not in the headspace to have this meeting. We're going to have to move it because I'm not going to waste everybody's time to sit here and try to do this when I'm not giving you the best of me. So if I'm sick or I'm not, whatever is going on, like I will delay having that in order to ensure it's as effective as it can be. So I don't know if that answers that, but that's how I do it. That's the, to the best of my ability, I am wherever my feet are. And I also am very clear with my plan. And like, I do, I absolutely will not walk into a day without a plan. I have yeah. to know what I'm doing that day. And that's really how I am most effective with what, what I'm going to be doing. So speaking of plan. What advice would you give to agents with all the noise that's happening right now? What do you think totally. it's going to take for agents to really succeed in this next market? Because you've been in this for a while. You've yeah. got experience. You oversee a lot of people in your community, a lot of people in your coaching programs, a lot of people in your network. What is it going to take for somebody to succeed in today's market? <laughs> it's so funny because I get asked this a lot. And there's, we have, to your point, hundreds of agents that we support. And there's a common thread amongst really anybody who's successful, not just individual agents. 
But it's so easy right now, especially in real estate, to get distracted. It's so easy all the time. Like we, the, the world is not designed for us to succeed. And it's easy to get distracted. We live in the digital diluge. But at the end of the day, I'm going to ask myself, what action am I avoiding by getting distracted or making this more complicated than it actually is? And that question almost always brings me back to what do I actually need to do that's going to move the needle? And whenever I'm working with an agent, that's what I'm going to keep coming back to. What actually moves the needle? And almost always, that's going to be you being in front of people. That's always going to be your job. We, as agents, we are in a people-oriented job. That is always going to be your job. And if you try to make it fancier or more complicated than it is, then probably not going to progress at the speed at which you would want. And so whenever I'm working with people, that it's a question that comes up all the time. Like, how do I win right now? I'm like, it's no different than how you win all the time. I love when people are like, we're going to get back to basics. I'm like, why did you leave? <laughs> like, why did you ever leave the basics? Because that's what makes people successful. And I think that the biggest challenge in any type of success, but what we're talking about real estate here, but this is a common thread amongst all people that are successful, is we become really successful and then we stop Virgo. doing, mm -hmm. yeah, all the things that made us successful. And there's this idea, I got this from, I read all of Jeff Bezos's letters that he sends to the board of directors. And he has this idea in his organization called Day One. Like he works in a building that's called Day One. And the way he articulates it is that every day of Amazon is Day One. In other words, like when I'm talking to an agent, I'll ask them, on Day One of your real estate career, how did you treat every lead? And they're like, oh my God, every lead mattered. Every conversation mattered. I went above and beyond for all the open houses. And I'm like, great, why did you ever leave? Why did you ever step into day two? So it's this idea that we should treat every day of our real estate as day one. And I've expanded this concept to my whole life because if I treat every day in my relationship as day one, then I'm going to have a really amazing relationship because on day one, we were like, we'll do anything to make our partner happy. We'll do anything to make them light up. But time happens and we get away from those things that actually made us successful in the first place. So I would tell people that treat it as day one, treat your business as day one and show up how you would have then with the same work ethic, with the same inspiration and in love with what you do. Love it. And speaking of day one, what's the day one habit that you've sustained in your life that has contributed to your success, Nikki? I think my day one habit is that I, like I said, I will just absolutely not walk into a day without a plan. That That's really, I, I would say business-wise, that's my number one. Like I will not walk into my day without knowing what I need to do that day. So before the email opens up, before the texts open up, before people start directing me away from what matters most, I'm focusing on what I need to do. What can I do that's actually going to move my organization forward? The other one I would say is just my thirst for growth and knowledge. Like I, and candidly, I, this is a surprise to even me. Like I remember being early on in the self-development journey and I was just just gobbling down books. Like I was reading everything I could get my hands on because I'm like, I'm just trying to figure out this life thing. I'm like 22 years old. I'm a hot mess like we all were. And I'm just trying to figure out like how to put all these pieces together. And I thought that maybe over time this would slow and it just really hasn't. And I am just still by nature a very curious person and still want to figure out how I can find that small edge or figure out that thing I can implement or that thing I can help my people with or do for them that would make their lives better or easier. And then I would say the last one, I know you asked me for one, I'm giving you three, I is, uh, is a, I have an orientation toward action. And I tend to be fast to action. I like to move fast and break things. It's totally my personality type. And it comes with consequences as all things do. There's always two sides of the coin. If, you're, if you have one great thing about you, there's another side to that coin. And so sure, like it can definitely create chaos. But I will have, I think so many people are trying to perfect the path forward or find the better path forward. Like they're looking for the easiest path, not realizing that the obstacle is the way. And they're trying to figure out how to do this thing. And I tell people often, you can try and pontificate on the perfect plan all day, but we find the right path forward by implementing the imperfect plan. You have to move. And that's the only way to know the better path. And I have had an orientation toward action it's helped me to just figure things out faster and sooner than others would because I did it. I actually moved through that thing. Yeah. And that's been an enormously helpful for me in my life and business. Well, you learn so much quicker, even if you fail and it sucks, right? Okay. And so it's like failure is just always feedback. It's when you actually quit. It's like true failure. 
Right. And so you've dropped so many nuggets today. What's next for Nikki? What are you most excited about that you're working on right now? I think I'm most excited for what I believe will really be a change in the real estate industry in what we do and how people approach individual agents and how they approach how they need to be supported and what their businesses need. And I think that that's what's really next for me, that I just have a passion to help simplify. I believe, like I, I always say, I don't like the B word in my organization. I'm, not, I'm nobody's boss. I just don't. I hate it. And I'm not the CEO or the founder. I always call myself, I'm the CSO, which is the chief simplicity officer. And my job is to take all of this noise and all of this chaos and all of these things that could happen or whatever and take these really broad complicated and complex concepts and simplify them into very simple and easy to articulate solutions for our people. And I think that's where all of my energy and focus is going right now. How can I make this even quieter, even simpler, and even more actionable to help people win? Where can people connect with you? Best places on Instagram at the Nikki Miller, and I'm N-I-K-K-I since there's so many spellings of Nikki. So at the Nikki Miller on Instagram, or you can uh, find our podcast, which is just the one thing. Yeah, that's those are the easiest places to find me. And I'd we'll love to connect it. with everybody. I like being able to actually stay connected. If somebody got value out of this, I'd love to hear it. Yes. Well, they'll definitely screenshot it. That's just my community. And we'll put it in the show notes so people can connect with you. And there's always one question as we wrap up that I ask every guest on the show is what does Nikki do to play bigger at business or in life? I think to play bigger, you have to think bigger. I think in order to play bigger, you have to think bigger and you have to challenge yourself daily to think bigger and also believe bigger. Like we are, what I tell people often when they get limiting beliefs, I'm like, we are literally all like the secret of the universe is that we're all making this up as we go. This is all made up. There's literally no rules here. Like you can go and it, there's no, anyone who says you can't do something, it's like, wh where does that come from? How do you, at some point people are like, you're, you want to fly? No, you're not going to be able to do that. We've just proven it wrong so many times. There are literally no rules in order to play bigger. You have to think bigger and you have to know that there are quite simply no limitations on what's possible. So if you see a better path, you see a better way, you see a big dream, go fight for that dream. Yeah. It's just living proof that someone, if you see it, it's living proof. And I always say, if the vision is in you, it's for you, right? 100%. Yeah. And I also think that success doesn't interrupt us. Like, and that dream is not going to interrupt us. And I think some people get put off by, oh, it's actually hard. I'm like, yeah, a big life never promised to be an easy one. I don't know when you signed that contract, but it's going to be hard. So just embrace the challenges and know that anything worth building, anything worth having, anything worth creating, it comes with its challenges. And that's the fun of it too. I always tell people, Raquel, I'm sure you're the same way, but I look back at my life and my favorite stories to tell are the ones where I fought, where I showed up when nobody else would have, when I did the hard things. Those are my favorite stories to tell. I never tell the story of, oh, I just showed up and everything fell in my lap and it was super easy. Like that never happened. I don't happened. even remember so I, I was going to say I couldn't tell that story even if I wanted to. But you know what I mean? Like those, yeah. it's, those stories are the ones that we want to tell people. And so go and write the most amazing, adventurous, incredible, audacious story that you could write so that we can all hear about it. Oh, so good. And I absolutely want to thank you, my friend, for being on the show. I super appreciate you. I know your time is so valuable. And I cannot wait to keep playing bigger with you, my friend. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. This was so fun. So fun. 